will be our fourth message in the series on assurance. Receive tonight, receiving the word in much assurance. Now, assurance is being able to navigate through life in confidence and without fear. And you should know that this is a kind of a rare posture. Assurance doesn't ask a lot of questions. It gives thanks for privilege. And assurance is antithetical or contrary to and opposite to doubt and uncertainty and questioning. Our text says our gospel, by that Paul means the gospel that I preached, which I owned, I made it my own. Our gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. As ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And we conducted ourselves so this assurance, you'd see it in us and you'd be able to participate in it yourself. Receiving the word in much assurance. Now, Judas introduced this well, what it means to receive. Let's, let's look at this a little more closely now. What does it mean to receive the Word of God? There's actually two words given for receive in the Gospels. Slightly different nuance in each one of them. Mark 4.16 gives one. These are they likewise which were sown on stony ground, who, when they heard the word of God, immediately receive it with gladness. <clears throat> it is, re take hold of it, receive it, take hold of it, accept it, hold it, obtain it. In the case of the soil, it went down into the, into the soil. Another word is used in Mark 4, 20, the same parable. These are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word of God and receive it, and bring forth fruit, some 30-fold, some 60, some 100. Here the word is a slightly different word. It means to take it up, take it upon oneself. To, it's more than just pick it up. It's take it up, to own it, maintain it. It has to do with to acknowledge this is mine, and thus it produces fruit. <clears throat> now it's in this latter sense that I'm using the word, receiving the word of much assurance. So take it up, work it into the fabric of life, not forgetting it, using it like seed growing in the ground. Seed that doesn't hit a rock. Seed that's not choked out by other cares of the world and so forth, riches and other things. We're speaking about receiving as more retaining and it bearing fruit and being productive in a person's life. That's the receiving the word of God we're talking about here shaping your life around it when you hear it. Now this work has a beginning that can be nullified as is found in the rocky soil and the soil that had seeds, thorns, and thistles beneath the ground. They, were, they hadn't, hadn't grown up yet. This type of receiving can be nullified by a competing interest. We understand, but we're not, we're not addressing it from that viewpoint. Now, what word are we talking about? Receive the word. What, what word are we talking about when he says that? What, what word generates much assurance 
receive it in much assurance. What word are we talking about there? Are we talking about Proverbs? Are we talking about the Old Testament prophets? Are we talking about the law of Moses? What are we talking about when we talk about receiving the word? Well, we're talking about the gospel. That's what we're talking about. Not the gospel introduced, the gospel proclaimed. That's what we're talking about. The Declaration of Acts 20, 28 says the gospel of the grace of God. It's a message that accents grace. We'll view from another viewpoint, the same gospel is the gospel of God, Romans 1, 1. The gospel of God, this is used several times in Scripture. The gospel of God, which announces God's gracious purpose and intent and his objective for mankind. Why he sent Jesus, why he delivered up Jesus, why, why he raised Jesus, why he exalted Christ Jesus, why he loved Jesus, why he provided all things through Jesus. It's the gospel of God. I know you're aware of this, but a lot of people have never heard the gospel of God. Mm -hmm. We've never heard it, what God has provided. From another standpoint, it's the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. That's the good news of the report of what Jesus has done and what he is doing. Amen. Now, a lot of people have heard a, an exposure to what he has done. Generally, it's that he loved them and died for them, but they, don't, they haven't heard that he destroyed the devil or that he spoiled principalities and powers, or that he reconciled us to God, or that he opened up a new and living way. See, they haven't, they haven't heard a lot about this. This means they haven't heard the real gospel. They've just heard kind of a mimicking of the gospel, not the real thing. This is what we're talking about, if you heard. The word, we heard the word in much assurance. This is the word we're talking about here. It's the proclamation of peace is another viewpoint of it. Romans 10, 15. How beautiful are the feet of them that publish glad tidings of the gospel of peace. We announce peace has been made between God and man. Yeah, this is quite an announcement. God was angry, it's not anymore. It's quite a message. We are without God, now we're not. This is the word now that we talk about receiving and much assurance of the word. This is the word we're talking about. It's the port, report of your salvation, Ephesians 1.13 calls it. You have heard the gospel of your salvation. So it's personalized. So you hear the gospel when you say, this is for me. I, I see it now. The provision is for me. Now believe me when I tell you, a lot of people have never had this kind of a Response. They've just, the main thing they're heard, concerned about is how to get rid of my sin, not so that it won't have any power anymore, so my conscience won't bother me anymore. See, well, God made provision for that too, but see, a lot of people have never, they never really have heard the gospel. Amen. Now, how, the, how did the Thessalonians receive it, this, this word? Well, it came to them in, in power. You received the word, you received not the gospel, not only in word with your ears, but in power, because the gospel is the power. This is the kind of power that produces something, like a dynamo power. It's the kind of power that affects something. You were changed when you heard this gospel. It came to you in power. Yeah. Overthrew the wicked one. It enabled you to say no to worldly lust and ungodliness. See, it had power. You heard it in power. 
I love to think about it. Amen. Now, it presumes that there was an accurate and a faithful report of the gospel. Yeah. Our gospel, it was a faithful and accurate report of the gospel. See, a half gospel or a third gospel or no gospel cannot be received with power. Why is it that there is a lot of worldliness in the church and a lot of disinterest in the church and a lot of the attitude I can do without God except once in a while in the church? Why does that exist? Because the gospel has not been preached or received in power. Why is there a powerless church? Because it's heard a powerless gospel. And it came to you not only in power, it came to you in or with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came with the gospel. He came in convicting power, convincing the world of sin, righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, not of sin because I slept with a neighbor's wife, although that, that's because you could be convicted of that. But that's... That's not what we're talking about here. Yeah. Of sin because they believed not on me. They weren't trusting in Jesus. They weren't believing in Jesus. They weren't depending on Jesus. That's what the Holy Spirit convinces a person of through the gospel. And it covers all the other things, you understand. <laughs> but that's a specific thing. Some people just want to be forgiven for the the adultery they committed. Well, that can be done. I can understand that, but you want to be forgiven of the sin of unbelief. And the Holy Spirit will convince you you weren't, you weren't trusting in Jesus. The Jesus that's announced in the gospel. Holy Spirit, he came come with sanctifying power that it could effectively set you apart. The Word of God says that the Holy, you, you heard the Word and you be, you begotten of God through the sanctification of the Holy Spirit and the belief of the truth. First Peter one and two, sanctifying power that took you effect effectively separated you from the world so that you obtained a prevailing interest in God and Christ and the great salvation. And you separated from these other things. What did that? That's the power of the Holy Spirit did that. You received it in the Holy, Holy Spirit. And as First Peter 1, 2 also says, you receive the Holy Spirit unto obedience. Unto obedience. Now I want to comment a little bit further on this matter of the gospel before I go further on this. This gospel is the record God has given of his son. It's what God has accomplished through Christ that needed to be accomplished that wasn't accomplished before. And as this word is preached to you, the Holy Spirit goes to work and sanctifies you. And Jesus said, I have... I've given them the word you have given me and they have believed surely that I came out from you. My disciples, they believe that truth that I came out from you. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. Here's how 1 Peter 1, 2 states it. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through... This is how he implemented the election. Through the sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience. You couldn't obey otherwise, see? 
in Adam, you really can't obey God. Not like God intends to be for you to obey him. But when you receive the word of God in the Holy Spirit, you are enabled to obey the form of doctrine was delivered to you and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. And this power of the Holy Spirit, it had the begetting power. First Peter 1 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Begotten. We would say he was born again through this word of God. And it produced a hope. It produced a hope in you. Now you receive the word of God, he said, in, in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. Now the gospel was declared by Paul with confidence and much assurance. So in that sense, it came, it came from a messenger that was confident and assured. But it begat a confidence and assurance in the people. That is, when they heard it, they recognized this was for them. And they were willing to seize this with violence, to do anything that was necessary to obtain this great salvation. Assurance is not something no, assurance is not something here that is developed. It's something that is received. Now this changes the whole view of the text. There's a sense of which I, I suppose that assurance is developed as you walk with God. That's not what he's talking about here. You received it, came to you in or with is the idea. It came with power. It came with the Holy Spirit. And it came with much assurance. It was something that was received. It was a, undoubtedly I see that I'm forgiven. Undoubtedly I see that I've been reconciled to God. Undoubtedly I see that God's righteousness, he's made me righteous. How, do, how is a person like can be, how can a person be assured of such things as this, as these? How can they be confident of such things as these? Is this a matter of education? Is that what it is? Is this a matter of learning that the scriptures say this and you repeat them to yourselves and finally, finally it dawns upon you? Is that the, what this text is talking about? No, it is not what the text is talking about. What honest and good hearts, what of honest and good hearts that do not have much assurance? Why is that? Is because they haven't heard the gospel. Because the gospel, the true gospel, when it's preached with power and with insight, the gospel comes with much assurance. Amen. Amen. This is what it produces in the people. Isn't that a marvelous thing to ponder? Amen. You, many of you have assurance. How did you come by this assurance? You come by it when it finally gradually begins to dawn on you, the truth of the gospel begins to dawn on you, and that's what produced the assurance. Uh, amen. It was the gospel that produced the assurance. Now you see the danger and sin of an erroneous gospel or another gospel. Amen. See, when you have another gospel, then you've got to have a whole battery of specialists to deal with human problems. You've got to have counselors, and you've got a psychiatrist, and you've got, <laughs> got to have all these special agents to help people address their difficulties because they don't have assurance. And the reason they don't have assurance is they haven't heard the gospel, which comes with much assurance, as well as with power and with the Holy Spirit. 
But if you take away this gospel, there's no power, no Holy Spirit, and no much assurance. There could be no doubt in this text, brethren, that when the gospel is preached in truth by a person who owns it and sees it and has experienced it, as the people receive that gospel, assurance begins to develop in their heart. They have much assurance because you can't really launch out into the deep unless you have much assurance. You can't get out of the boat and walk on the water unless you have assurance. When you read what God expects you to do, be perfect as he is perfect. Be ye holy, for I am holy. And you read these requirements that God has walked before me and be thou perfect. You read these. You can't do these without assurance. And you can't have assurance without being subjected on a regular basis to insightful proclamation of the gospel of Christ. It came in much assurance. Let me read the text again. Our gospel came not unto you in word only. It did come in word, but not in word only. But also in power. That's the idea of with is the idea. And in the Holy Ghost. And in much assurance. As ye know what manner of men we were among you. See, you saw it live... You saw it lived out in us, which means you weren't reluctant, see, to embrace this gospel because we were a light, a bright and shining light that displayed what it means to retain this gospel. And when you did, much assurance. I ask you the question, have you received the gospel in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. That's something you have to weigh for yourself. But the way you know it is, is by your response to the gospel. Amen. If a person tends to think, well, I've heard the gospel and I've pretty well got that down. I, I kind of would rather hear something else. Then without the gospel, you, the power goes away. The spirit goes away. Amen. Much assurance goes away. Why? Because God will not allow these things to flourish where his son is not received. Amen. And his son cannot be received where the record of him is not declared. I have to, I have to close at this time, but... I hope you see this, uh, this marvelous truth that the gospel is the cause of power to do whatever God requires you to do. And the gospel is the cause for the Holy Spirit working in you. He's why you were sealed. The grace of the gospel is why you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. All this came with the gospel. And here's how, here's, here's how it works. The more you hear the gospel and the wider your understanding of the gospel, the larger the power gets, the larger the ministry of the Holy Spirit gets, and the more assurance you have. Amen. This, this is how it works. Amen. And if the gospel is held to a minimum, then everything else shrinks. Because it's attached to the word of the gospel. The gospel comes, it's like a messenger pigeon. <laughs> 
it comes with a message that is discerned by faithful hearts. You see the truth of it. Christ loved me and gave himself for me. Now I just count everything else but, but dung. Yes. Now that I know that, I live for Christ Amen. who loved me and gave himself for me. See? Amen. Now when you hear this gospel, you learn that the Holy Spirit, he's ultra sensitive to the gospel. <clears throat> Jesus was raised from the dead by the Spirit, you know, it says, quickened by the Spirit. And he, the Spirit, he walked in the Spirit. He was full of the Spirit. And when you hear this, this message, and it's, it's expounded to you, what is involved in you being reconciled to God and being sons of God and being heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, and this begins to grow in your spirit, you can run through a troop and leap over a wall. You're not intimidated by mockers or people that find fault or people that say you've lost your mind. It's, yeah, this doesn't move a confident person. And I can tell you that a, confidence, a confident person in Christ causes a certain kind of a fear in opponents. They don't tell you this. They won't tell you this. But they have a sort of a fear of a person who can walk confidently before God. And that uh, that person can be you.